tonight um, we're really fortunate to have arguably one of the most successful pop artists uh, in America. Um, and his name is uh, Tommy James. I'd like to welcome Tommy out with his co-author of the book, Martin Fitzpatrick. Thank you. How are you? It's a pleasure. pleasure. How are you, you doing? Thank you. Thanks. So hopefully you all have uh, had ample opportunity to uh, read the book. I know some of you must have because uh, my e inbox, my emails were uh, flooded the other night with queries as uh, I had asked you to do. Um, so <clears throat> my point in inviting Tommy here tonight is that um, not all of us perhaps are scholars or students of history, but those who don't know history are doomed to repeat those things that perhaps aren't the smartest things along the way. And while maybe some of you may be familiar with some of Tommy's songs and some of you may not be, um, the, the ballad, the story, the biography in this book has information that is extraordinarily important for you to understand how the music industry evolved and how it got to where it is today. And Tommy has been, with uh, his author, co-author, Martin, been uh, candid enough to share a lot of tales and stories and things that, quite frankly, most people wouldn't tell. Most people, it's like, you know, it's a conversation after hours that you tell uh, and you don't share. But Tommy's been very candid with Martin in telling stories about the industry. Just a couple of things uh, you might want to know about Tommy that maybe, you know, most of you probably weren't around in, in, in his heyday, um, but Tommy has uh, 23 gold singles, uh, nine gold and platinum albums, um, and is sold easily, if you can <laughs> count, count them legitimately, over 100 million, probably a lot more than that record sold globally. And uh, during the period in the late 60s, arguably sold more, 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 more music, more singles, more vinyl than the Beatles did. Um, he's got quite a track record that hasn't been broken to this day. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, he's the only artist on the Billboard charts that actually had one of his songs at number one replaced by another one of his songs at number one. Um, but we'll talk about some of that stuff later. But um, So Tommy, like many of you, had dreams and goals and ambitions. He was growing up in the Midwest in uh, Nile, Ohio. Niles, Michigan. Niles, Michigan. Niles, Michigan. Um, and um, he had a band when he was just a youngster and played around. I guess it took you almost like eight years before the national situation For the broke. overnight success. The overnight success, <laughs> eight years. But you started when you were young. I was 12 when I started my first band. And um, we, uh, we would play at uh, American Legion halls and sock hops. And this is back in 19... 59 and 60 and um, you know we were a cover band and uh, we uh, oh there he is yeah <laughs> seventh grade and um, uh, we called ourselves the tornadoes and uh, it was um, uh, it was a, a local group and we would uh, that's us practicing and um, that was my silver tone guitar, by the way, because I couldn't afford a, a Gibson or a Fender. That was so, silver tone, for those of you who don't know, was Sears. <laughs> Anybody ever have one? Did you really? Yeah. But the, now they're got to be a certain age to really appreciate a silver. Now tone. they're a collector's item and worth yes, a lot of money. Yes, they are. They're actually worth money now. I think I got mine for about thirty-nine bucks. And uh, anyway, that's it right there. So. Um, uh, this is us practicing at uh, the drummer's house, Nelson's, uh, who, by the way, called me a couple of days ago. We're still friends. He's 106. I'm 112. And, uh, what, what does he do today? Uh, he basically is, uh, he's retired now. He was, uh, for years, was an engineer. And uh, not a sound engineer, I mean, an actual. And uh, so anyway, we, uh, this is Niles, Michigan. And... Um, I guess I was about 13, 14 there, and we were a cover band and playing all over. And finally, um, <coughs> here's another shot of us in front of Nelson's house, my silver tone. And um, we, uh, I got a job in, a, in the Spinet Record Shop, which was a local 
retailer after school and on the weekends right in there. Oh, good. And um, this was called a record store. <laughs> Those were records. And uh, uh, this was uh, our crew, and uh, we sold a lot of vinyl. And uh, anyway, I had a, a great job there. I could promote my, my band out of the uh, out of the record store. And uh, Dickie, uh, who was Edith Frucci was her name, she uh, uh, basically uh, would sell to the uh, DJs who would come in from WNIL radio station. And uh, one of them who came in was, uh, his name was Jack Douglas. And uh, he informed me that uh, he was starting a little regional label called Snap Records. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, well, that, the first one was Northway, so that's Snap, yeah. And we had a couple of little regional deals when uh, we were in junior high and high school. So this was the second one. So in that time period, um, who were some of the other, I mean, I noticed in the record store shot the Beach Boys, but what was the musical landscape, landscape that you were involved in at the time? <coughs> what was surrounding you, the music? Well, I, I, of course, we were covering everybody that was on AM radio at the time, which would have been... Uh, uh, very early Four Seasons at that moment, 1962. Um, the Beach Boys came out that year. Uh, oh boy, uh, this was pre-Beatles actually. Right. And um, so um, I'm trying to think of the uh, very, there was a lot of one-shot groups back then. A lot of groups that would have one and two hits. There was Joey D and the Starlighters were out Dion there. Was there. Dion was out. But there was a lot of manufactured music back then. It was a lot, not, not, until the Beatles came along, other bands were not really self-contained. Well, that's true. And uh, being, by the way, being a, a cover band, a local cover band, a lot of people were in groups. For some reason, it was, there was just an explosion of local groups. And um, uh, everybody, uh, you know, it was a real job opportunity. And <laughs> so, I mean, if you were 14. And... Um, so there were a lot of groups all over, springing up all over um, in southern Michigan, northern Indiana, everywhere between Detroit and Chicago, just a, a ton of groups. And so uh, one of the four sides, by the way, Jack Douglas asked if we would sign with his label, and this was one of the four sides we did. It was uh, called Hanky Panky, and it was a, uh, uh, you know, a B-side of a record called That Boy John by the Raindrops. Uh, who was Jeff Barry and Ellie Greenwich, and now it's taken. Jeff, Jeff Barry and Ellie Greenwich are um, Brill Building writers, and they've had more hits than you can probably Anybody. recall. Yeah. I mean, they were very, very successful individually and collectively. But Ellie Greenwich just died last year, by right, the way. Just right, unfortunately. But um, in the record company structure today, a lot of the companies have what's called a research department, and they look for regional breakout records. I mean, they have guys that do that and, and call. They used to call local record stores. Now they, they uh, check SoundScan and, and, and um, look at the iTunes regional charts to find things that are popping or happening that are unsigned or available. True enough. And so that's something that's always been around. Um, that record, smart record guys would start regional records or find regional records yeah. and pick them up. And in your case, you found this song yeah. through your own... I don't think you thought it was research at the time, but you just... I saw another band play it and get an incredible response to it. Um, and uh, we had... Uh, another cover band? Another cover band. Because it wasn't... It wasn't called The Spinners. Right. And, and uh, they um, got this amazing response to Hanky Panky. And uh, frankly, I, uh, uh, we were always looking for those kind of party rock records, those kind of songs, the California Suns, and the, who was another, the Rivieras, by the way, drove me, I was so jealous I couldn't stand it. Everybody remember the Rivieras with California Sun, which was, uh, they were another local act that did make it. And uh, so anyway, we did Hanky Panky, and we put it out and had an amazing response locally to it. We were, oh, I guess number one in about six square blocks, and uh, then the record died. <laughs> And um, we pretty much, uh, from that point on, um, uh, forgot about the record. This was 1964, early 64. I was a junior when this, this record was out. And um, 
I graduated from high school the following year, 1965, and took my band on the road. We went through Chicago and up through uh, the Midwest. And in early... 11? Oh yeah, that's it. This, by the way, was up at Hillsdale College uh, in, in Michigan the week of the Kennedy assassination. That was uh, the Saturday night, and I couldn't believe they were still going to have this gig. It just, uh, every time I see that picture, it reminds me of that. Anyway, so... Um, you st still a Silvertone? Uh, no, by the, I'd moved up to a jazz master by so this Fender. time. A Fender, yeah. And um, so anyway, we... Um, in early 66, uh, the club we were working at, this would have been April of 66, the club we were working at in Wisconsin went belly up on me in the middle of my two weeks, and uh, the IRS shut them down, so we had to go home. Was that me? No. <laughs> okay. Kaboom. <laughs> it's like a drum roll. And um, so anyway, uh, we were heartbroken, and I felt like a failure, and um, I went back um, to... Uh, to Niles, and uh, uh, but that's how the man upstairs had it planned. Because uh, uh, the minute I get back to Niles, I get a call from Pittsburgh, from the distributor out there, Fenway. That um, so what years? This is this 65? is uh, this would have been sixty six. So this is two years after Snap Records. Correct. And you get a phone call from somebody in Pittsburgh. And and they inform me that uh, Hanky Panky was picked up out of a record cemetery, a record bin, and played at dances. This is one of those only in America stories. And um, the record was uh, manufactured there locally, bootlegged. 80,000 of them were sold in 10 days, and Hanky Panky is sitting at number one. So this is your first experience with somebody appropriating your music yeah, I said, without who is, compensating. Who is this? <laughs> That's right. That's one way to look at it, right? God bless the crooks, though, because um, uh, uh, at that point, um, they talked me into coming to Pittsburgh, which I did. I had no band, by the way, at that moment. And I went to Pittsburgh and did local, as soon as I got into the city limits, uh, I was a rock star. Outside the city limits, I was absolutely nobody. And that was on Red Fox? I think Red Fox was, Records. Yeah, oh, that was the bootleg copy right there, yeah. <laughs> Nifty little label, isn't it? And, uh, Still not... Tommy James, it's just the Chandels. No, Bells. that's right, that's right. And uh, so uh, I pick up the first bar band I can find there in Pittsburgh, and uh, they became the Chandels. And um, two weeks later, uh, I brought them to New York, and we were looking for a major label deal. We had a regional breakout in the trade papers because Pittsburgh was a major market. Yes. And um, so I came to New York, uh, I was 19. This would have been uh, May of '66, and um, but but you're you're 19 years old. Where do you get the the financial wherewithal or the or the, the I mean, 19 year olds even today just don't <laughs> they just don't pick up and just go okay uh, I'm I'm from Michigan and I'm gonna go find myself in New York City. Well, the people in Pittsburgh uh, became my managers and my agents at that moment who had brought me into Pittsburgh, a local uh, DJ slash club owner named Bob Mack, um, basically was financing everything. And um, so he brought me to New York. And uh, uh, we hooked up with a fellow by the name of Chuck Rubin who took us around to the record companies. And that was a great week to be going for a deal because we had a regional breakout in the trade papers. And um, oh, we got a yes from Columbia we got a yes from Atlantic. We got a yes from RCA. Uh, Epic. Um, Kama Sutra. Remember Kama Sutra Records? <laughs> and um, the last place they took the record to was Roulette Records, which was an independent label at the time. And we'd heard some rumors about them being connected, but you know, we didn't really care. When you say it was an independent label, very different than the concept of an independent label. Than the label. kind of corporate label, for example, that Columbia was. But today, an independent label is different from that very much so also. That's true. That's true. Independent simply meant back then that they were independently distributed. 
that they uh, did not have their own distribution set up, that they used independent. Uh, and, and today, the opportunities you had or the choices, you had many more places to go. There were a lot more labels That's true. to go That's true. There were over 300 uh, legitimate labels uh, in New York City that you could have hits with that were having hits at the time. You know, today there's like four. Right. Um, so it was a marvelous time to make it because all the ducks were in a row in, in the music business. The, uh, I must say the, uh, uh, you know, TV, radio, everybody was looking for the next big act. And it was just a marvelous time. Plus you had um, 60 million baby boom kids with money in their pockets supporting the whole thing. So it really was a great time to make it. So uh, the last place they took the record to was Roulette Records. And um, we had a yes from everybody else, so we probably wouldn't need Roulette. We were feeling great. Uh, the next morning, one by one, all the record companies uh, called us up and said, listen, we got a pass. And uh, of course, we said, what do you mean you got a pass? I thought we had a deal. And finally, Jerry Wexler at Atlantic um, leveled with us and told us that uh, Morris Levy, <laughs> very good, Morris Levy, the president of Roulette Records, had called every one of the labels and uh, said, this is my record, back off. And they did. And so we were apparently going to be on roulette. And I practiced that, by the way, for a long time. And uh, uh, it was true. Uh, roulette, um, we ended up signing with roulette. And of course, uh, what we didn't know at the time, that's right. And uh, what, we, what we didn't know at the time was that roulette, in addition to being a functioning record company was also a front for the Genovese crime family in New York. And um, But did, didn't you, at the time... Vito Genovese. <laughs> this is a picture I snapped of him myself. Did, did it not strike you odd when you had all these offers and all of a sudden they all rescinded them? I mean, what thoughts went through your mind? Well, obviously, um, you know, it was a pretty scary thing because uh, Morris Levy obviously had a very long reach. And, uh, you know, to back down Columbia Records and the big corporate labels was uh, unheard of, really. I had never heard of such a thing. And uh, he did it with a phone call. So they knew who Morris was. And, uh, but you didn't at the time. No, I, I, I knew nothing. Uh, my first trip to New York, uh, this is him later on. Um, Morris was quite a character. We, uh, when I went up to Roulette to uh, uh, sign the contract, uh, you know, and I, I met Morris for the first time, and uh, he was big. He was about, oh, 240, I guess, 250. He was a big guy, probably 6'3 or so. But the, the main thing was that he was, um, he sounded just like, he was right out of central casting. Um, he sounded like a mobster. He uh, played the role very well. And uh, you couldn't take your eyes off him. It was like watching a great actor. Uh, and when this big, booming, guttural voice that uh, would fill the whole place, uh, when he, uh, you know, he could make the earth shake if he wanted to. He was an amazing guy. Um, so we went up there in the middle. Here's his office. That's his desk, by the way, I'm sitting at. And um, um, as we're sitting there, um, I'm sorry, am I booming out here? Is this working? It is working. All right. Uh, um, as we're sitting there talking, um, the people in the room were amazing. There was George Goldner, who had Redbird Records, who was one of the companies that said yes the day before. He, George Goldner was the, oh yeah, the producer and the discoverer of acts like Little Anthony Imperials, the Chantels. He had End Records, Gone Records, Rama Records. 
and was Morris's partner. Uh, Murray the K, the famous disc jockey, was also sitting in the, uh, in the room, Red Schwartz and Henry Glover from Roulette. And all of a sudden, as I'm small talking with Morris, that's Red Schwartz right there, uh, a few years later, but that's Red. Um, as I'm small talking with Morris, uh, two thugs walk in. Uh, no doubt about it. It was, did you know Nate McCalla? And um, from Calla Records, J.J. Jackson was one of their artists. And uh, they had a bunch of hits right at that moment. Morris was, he was Morris's enforcer. He was uh, one of the most decorated war heroes out of the Korean War, and he was a, a, a killer. So you're walking into, it's like a, a, like a movie, there's all these characters. And for those of you who don't know, we're talking about, you know, the, the industry has always been peppered by the uh, cult of personality, whether it's a Clive Davis, an Ahmet Erdogan, um, you know, and here you are with this fellow that not everybody's aware of outside the business, but inside the business, Morris Levy, who, if you've read the book, you understand the man's power and reach and what he could do. Yes. He, he was called the godfather of the music business. And uh, if, if we could just go back to that roulette record, just to give you a, a practical example, you'll notice that this was made in Greece uh, in 1958, I, I believe that says, which is eight years before the record actually existed. So, so Hanky Panky is on here, which came out in 66. That was Morris. So anyway, um, uh, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, uh, at any rate, so they, these two thugs walk into uh, Morris's office, and uh, you can, he says, excuse me. And he gets up, and he walks over, and Morris, could we see you a second? And they go over, and uh, um, he, Morris goes over to, to greet them, and they uh, tell him that they, um, uh, they, they had just beaten up some guy with baseball bats and broke his legs for bootlegging Morris's records out in Jersey. So this was overheard, and Red Schwartz turns to me and he says, So, Tom, uh, first trip to New York? And I'm like, Hamna, Hamna. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, I, we overheard all that, of course, and it was just made everything very cumbersome and burdensome, but we signed anyway. So that's that was a, our first trip. To that's work. actually when the tagline for the book was, was uttered, because Morris back in and came back in and saw Tommy acting a little nervous, and that's when he put his arms on his shoulders and said, I hope you're ready, kid, because you're about to go on one hell of a ride. That actually happened. <laughs> um, and you did. Yes, indeed. So Hanky Panky then uh, was coming out on roulette, and we were signed with roulette. And, the, the, you know, strangely enough, um, you know, roulette needed us. And, and I've often thought over the years how, in a way, uh, fortunate we were to go with roulette at that moment because um, they left us alone and allowed us to become uh, whatever we could become in the studio. If we had signed with Epic or Columbia or one of the corporate labels, we probably would have been handed to a producer and lost in the numbers, and I don't know if anybody would have heard from us again, truthfully. They gave, they gave you your creative freedom. They really did. They no royalties, but uh, a lot of creative freedom. So, but this song became the anthem and the soundtrack for the summer of 1966? It really did. It was the number one record of the summer, and I, I must tell you, I, uh, Hanky Panky, that is, they uh, did an incredible job of promoting the record. This was the gold record. This is Morris's ashtray, and we stuck a disc in his ashtray, and we're holding it up like this. Anyway, uh, this was the group, and uh, that was our first gold record of Hanky Panky, and that uh, it went gold so fast, it just exploded. I, I don't think there's anything more exciting than an exploding hit single. And uh, Hanky Panky really Where did. were you when you first heard Hanky Panky on the radio and it wasn't in your hometown or Pittsburgh? Yeah, that would have been um, probably on WMCA in New York. Um, Which is a, a religious station here in New York uh, at uh, 57 now. But back then, 
<coughs> it was one of the three major top 40 stations. That's so right. you, what, what were the circumstances where you heard it? Well, um, first of all, uh, MCA went right on the record, uh, which is very unusual because New York is usually the last market to go on anything. And um, uh, it went on, we were introduced to a fellow by the name of Herbie Rosen, who was the great promotion man in New York, who worked uh, all of our records in New York and just immediately got it on WMCA. It then went on WLS in Chicago, it, um, KHJ out in the West Coast, uh, uh, Minneapolis, St. Louis, it just was everywhere at once and within, we jumped, literally jumped on the charts at 81 and the next week we jumped to 21. So that's how fast the record happened. And uh, it began this relationship with Roulette Records which um, was tumultuous, it was crazy, uh, it was wild, but we would start to see things, we'd start to connect the dots, like uh, uh, some very strange people were hanging out at Roulette Records. Roulette Records was used as everything from a social club to uh, illegal bank accounts, I mean, uh, every possible way. And the people who were coming up, you know, would have boxes of something and they'd leave them and they'd leave and nobody knew what that was. Um, we would meet people in Morris's office and two weeks later we'd see him on TV. This is one of them. Oh, this is, <laughs> yeah, this was, uh, his, his name was Sonny Vastola. Um, uh, this is a pretty young shot of Vastola actually, but uh, he was one of the roulette regulars and um, we'd meet people in Morris's office and two weeks later we'd see him being taken out of uh, uh, a warehouse in New Jersey in handcuffs, you know, doing the perp walk. Isn't that the guy we just met up in Mars's office? And it was. And um, uh, gradually we would... Uh, <clears throat> so, so did you just think that was like, that was how it was? I guess so. I guess we thought that was normal. Um, we, <laughs> you know, just a lot of guys like this. But I mean, um, I mean, so you figured if you had signed with Columbia or Epic or Atlantic, there would be some of those characters hanging out there sure, too. Sure, they'd probably have hands behind their back. Um, well, all I knew is that, that, you know, it became pretty obvious that uh, uh, Roulette Records was, uh, there were some pretty scary people up there. And of course, then uh, the next thing was getting paid. And um, where were your parents in this process? They were back home in Niles, Michigan. <laughs> but you were, you were a minor. That's mom and dad, by the way, when they were on their honeymoon. But you were a minor. I mean, you were under 21. That's true. Uh, I, they allowed me to, uh, there's mom, there's one of our, there's our house in Niles. Uh, that's the cat. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a cat, Taffy, that's right. Uh, boy, this is weird, I got it. <laughs> um, yes, I, well, they were back in Niles and they always encouraged me to do this, though. I must tell you, ever since I brought home $2,100 from the American Legion Hall. They encouraged me to keep doing this. So I, it was, I, had, I was a veteran pretty much by the time I had gone to New York. And, and they were not aware of some of Morris's uh, Not until I told them, not, in, not until later. Um, a lot of people were though in the music business and uh, uh, you know, I had to, uh, I realized early on I had to really be careful. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thought that was your fault. <laughs> I, I realized that we had to be careful. We were walking on eggshells and uh, you know, all the time we're, we're, we're having hit records, there's this very dark and dangerous story going on behind us. And uh, we constantly had to measure one reality of having uh, success up there with the other reality of being very afraid and very concerned uh, because it was the first time we had a confrontation over royalties. Um, it became very clear and we were led to understand plainly that uh, what happened to Jimmy Rogers, which was another roulette artist, could very easily happen to us. He was. Jimmy Rogers, remember, had Honeycomb and several hits with Roulette and um, was a big, big star. 
in the late 50s and early 60s, and he went after his royalties. He, went, he took them to court. And uh, he, he turned up uh, uh, left for dead on an L.A. freeway, uh, beat up by guys posing as cops and turned out to be mob guys. And um, uh, he survived by the skin of his teeth only because he was in such good shape. He was never the same again. And so that, it was, there was no mistake in it with that could have happened to us. What about your manager? Who was your manager at the time? Well, my manager was the other fellow you saw in, um, in the uh, signing picture with Morris, and that was Lenny Stogel. And Lenny Stogel was pretty... What happened pretty to the guy from Pittsburgh? He had a falling out with Morris. Oh. <laughs> and... Uh, he went away. He went away. I don't mean he killed him. I mean no, no. he just went away. <laughs> and, and I'm gonna he assume, walked away. And I'm, and I'm going to assume that the record companies strongly su suggested you take this uh, gentleman, Mr. Stogel, along as your manager? Absolutely. And uh, so it was all in-house. And, uh, you know, as I said, I constantly had to weigh the fact that we were, I had a lot of mixed feelings about all this. That's Lenny Stogel on the left there. I had a lot of mixed feelings about this because of the, uh, the fact that we were having success up there. And did I really want to rock the boat? And, um, and you had creative freedom. And I had it my own. I was running the show as far so as... So how did the first album... Okay, so you have this huge hit song, Hanky Panky. Right. Which every bar band in America is learning how to play those chords and, right. and doing stuff, which had to be a thrill for you to walk around. It was incredible. It was incredible. You know, the other side of this is that, you know, you think you're ready for a hit record. You know, you pr I, I prepared for it all my life. It's all I ever wanted to be was one of those rock and roll guys. Um, it's not like I knew how to do anything else either. Um, so uh, to have this, I, what I felt was right out of heaven, uh, this incredible success and uh, a chance now to really keep going. And uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden I'm playing with my heroes, the animals and uh, Herman's Hermits and, and guys that I had uh, sold their records a year earlier I'm now uh, working with. And to be invited into this club of, uh, uh, in New York, the, you know, the, the soundtrack to our lives, basically, about 90% of it, was created in this little six square block area of Manhattan. All the studios were there, the record companies. Um, it was quite amazing. And when they invited you to come up and join, it was like, some kind of exclusive little club that uh, it was like going to Santa's workshop in Disneyland. All it's like running away with the circus. That's really what it felt like. And uh, so I was just having a ball, and and uh, uh, we had the run of the place at Roulette, and it didn't get darker till later. I was having too much fun right at that. So, moment. a lot of students here are musicians. Sure. Some of them have bands. Some of them will be in bands. What advice would you offer them? once they have the level of success you had i mean i mean what i mean obviously a lot of things immediately come to you but what would you say would be something well you know first of all um it's so different today unfortunately and, and for the worse um the options out there are very few record companies are not signing anybody they're losing market share all over the place there's not a uh uh, there's the, the, the charts are so fractured because of the uh, uh, there's 12 different charts when you open Billboard the music business really the record business that we all grew up with basically doesn't exist anymore that's the truth and uh, the music business still does but the record business doesn't and the record business was this incredible social network of people this infrastructure that is gone and, you know, you can make great little records in your basement now, and you can do things technically you could never do before. We would have killed for this technology. Uh, but the infrastructure to become successful is very limited. Now, I don't believe it's going to stay that way. I have tremendous faith in the collective greed of everybody in the record business, in the music business. I really do believe, I'm, I don't mean to get off 
subject here, but I really do believe that um, once high def TV comes on uh, in earnest, that we're going to, the music business is going to move to television. I don't mean like MTV, I mean in a whole new way. I think we're going to have the Sony channel, we'll probably have the Warner channel. With, I believe we'll have video radio. I think all you got to do to have uh, is put a couple of digital cameras in a radio booth like Imus did uh, back in, uh, you know, 12 years ago and to have, uh, and, and have, um, no reason you can't do that with music radio. And basically we'll have video radio stations. Your TV will be your iPod. You can download probably to a little MP3 player attached to your cable box or maybe your set. And they'll have charts based on those downloads. And so the, the industry of eventually in the next few years will reinvent itself. We're just in a very awful time right now where the number one challenge is to get new music in front of the fans. There's virtually no way of doing that other than uh, downloading or, or going on your computer. A computer is really a terrible way of, of hearing music for the first time. You know, what made radio so great was that you were aware that there was a million other people listening to that same record at that moment, and all the stations were playing the same records. You know, the top 40 meant top 40 slots uh, based on sales. And so all, there was this network of 50,000 watt stations across the country, uh, New York, LA, Chicago, all the big markets, that were all playing the same music. Uh, that's not true today. And, and nothing ever took its place. Nothing, there's nothing comparable today, even on a computer. And I, uh, the social aspect of rock and roll is very, very important, and you really don't have that today. The <clears throat> as you talk about, the playlists were very similar across the country. And that critical mass of exposure is what led to the amazing sales oh. you had with that, which, as you say, in a fragmented market today doesn't exist. Right. But there was something that you guys had back then that doesn't exist today. There was one critical medium that everybody could go to, and that was a focal point, and that was on Sunday nights on television, the Ed Sullivan sure. Show. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Where people would go in and mom and dad would watch what they wanted to watch, whether it was Sophie Tucker or the Dancing Bears. But then... There was always one act for you kids, yeah. whether it was the Beatles, ah, the Rolling Stones, that's and you. Right. Now, you had your experience with Mr. Sullivan where he actually flubbed your name. Several times, yes. What, what, um, how did he introduce you or back announce it? Well, what happened was the, the week before our first Ed Sullivan show. What song was this for? This was for Crimson and Clover. Okay. And uh, uh, Bob Precht, who was the producer of the Ed Sullivan show, who was Sullivan's um, uh, son-in-law had this incredible, I wanted to take this guy to the racetrack, he had this incredible ability to pick the, the week your record was going to peak to have you on the show. And whether it was at number six, number two, number one, uh, this unbelievable knack for picking the hits. And he'd book groups, you know, weeks in advance believing that that record was going to peak at that at that moment, and he was almost always right. He was with us. Um, the week before we were supposed to do Sullivan, I had just finished the tour with the Beach Boys, and we're sitting. Uh, Mike Love, as a matter of fact, was sitting with us in uh, our suite at the uh, Hyatt House on Sunset Strip. They call it the Riot House, and. Uh, uh, in Los Angeles and we're, we're watching the Sullivan show because they had done the Sullivan show about two dozen times and so I picked his brain. I was scared. I was scared to death. We were booked on the following week and it was live TV and you know the fate of Crimson and Clover was a train wreck waiting to happen on the Sullivan show. You knew those guys were not going to get it right. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm watching and, and Ed goes uh, next week, right here in our show, Tony Jones and the Spondells will be here. <laughs> Tony Jones and the Spondells. And <laughs> so, yeah, which means, number one, he never heard of you, and number two, he can't read, right? So, um, uh, 
it went downhill from there, actually. <laughs> we went, or, you know, Mondays you had off, Tuesdays you started dress rehearsals, and they lasted all week. And, uh, but, we this an a, but this was a major yeah. exposure yeah. medium, and this is a way that you really, you blow your record out. Oh, if you, it could go either way. If you screwed up the Sullivan Show, your career could be over. If you did great and, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the girls screamed and everything worked, you could, you could sell another uh, three quarters of a million records, you know, within two weeks. It, it was just a phenomenal, uh, uh, had a, this capacity to, to move people. And so we rehearsed all week long. They got it. We did Crimson and Clover and I think Moni Moni. You have to do a different version? We, oh, uh, so I begged them to let me do a lip sync because you knew they weren't going to get it right. So um, they said, okay, I'll tell you what, you give us a four track of the of Crimson and Clover so we can mess with it and so it doesn't sound like the record and you can do a lip sync. So uh, thank God and I went over to the studio and I mixed four tracks of mono. <laughs> it was mono. I actually had a mono mix of all, all four tracks. Uh, the needles weren't quite right, but I, I thought this is the only way I'm going to get away with this. And uh, I handed them basically a mono mix. And uh, <clears throat> I wasn't sure if they'd go for it or not, but they did. So no matter what track they were bringing up, they were just raising and lowering the mono mix. So I felt comfortable about that. And um, uh, came off great. He finally got my name right, but I go over to talk to Ed. When you headline the show, you know, you always had to talk with Ed. And uh, by the end of the show, Ed would get pretty tanked. You know, he, you know, he'd slip around, you know, during the show, and he'd put a few down. And by the end of the show, you know, he was real. And, and uh, you know, he he once asked Jack Jones if his father was still alive. You know, I mean, stuff like that. Um, he'd get twirled up in the curtain, you know, and he. It's really happened, so you never knew. Simon, if you were the last act, it was rare. So Simon Cowell back in the '60s. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So uh, he calls me over and says, now, Tommy, I understand you were born and raised in New York City. No. <laughs> no. So, uh, so anyway, I told him, I, I gave him every way to climb down out of that tree. Uh, I told him, uh, actually, I was born in Dayton, Ohio, grew up in Niles, Michigan, but I've lived here for the last four years, and gave him every excuse, and he wouldn't go for it. He said, once again, born and raised in New York, <laughs> As I left. Anyway, that was our first Sullivan show. And we went number one that day. Uh, Billboard, you know, the trade papers came out on Sunday night. And um, we went number one at that moment. I couldn't believe it. it and then sold another 300,000 records the next week from being on the Sullivan show. Now, you also were, <coughs> I guess, considered a, a pioneer in video because back when MTV showed videos, they always have a closet classic. And somehow they always had this old black and white footage. Of Moni, right? Right. Well, we actually had filmed that in color, but <laughs> who knew? Um, uh, well, this is 1968, and I always believed that it made a whole lot of sense to make a film of your hit record. I didn't know why other people hadn't done that, and uh, they'd be shown all over television and so forth. And uh, uh, so it, it made a lot of sense to do. So we made one of Moni Moni, and uh, we couldn't get it played anywhere. They they would not let television people had the attitude that rock and roll people were not going to tell them what to do, and so the only place we could get the thing played was uh, movie theaters in 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 uh, Europe. Uh, between the double features was the only place. So it was me and Daffy Duck for a long time. That was it. And we did a couple of videos and couldn't get them played anywhere. So. Uh, we just stopped it. So you did more than just one? We did one for uh, uh, She, which was another hit record we had. And we did one, I think, for Crystal Blue Persuasion. So back to my question, you know, Panky Panky, you're a young guy. So today, what would you say to people who are thrust into the situation where, like you were, having a hit song? How do you keep your head on straight? How do you avoid the pitfalls? I mean, obviously, people are going to be throwing themselves at you, enticing you with all sorts of ways of co-opting your- You should be so lucky. 
Uh, well, you know, the, 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 there, there's truth in that, of course. But I mean, you, you, you know, the, the basic uh, idea is that you're an on-the-job trainee no matter what you do. Every situation is different. I guess the only thing is the same is that you got to, it's very easy to fall into chemicals to start popping pills. We did it. Um, uh, it's, it's incredibly easy to, um, by the way, forget your mission. You know, uh, th that's an interesting one. Um, you get used to having hits and the feeling uh, sort of becomes uh, of elation. You know, that first summer, we were elated. I, I can't tell you what that felt like. It was like every dream coming true. See, uh, hearing yourself on the radio all over, uh, you know, uh, doing the big rock shows and everything. Is that the best high you ever had? It's, it's like falling in love for the first time. You can never do it again. And uh, it's the greatest feeling in the world. I never had a more intoxicating feeling ever in my life. And um, it was wonderful. But then you got to do it again. Right. And then you got to do it again. And one of the things, I guess the thing at that time, that became the obsession was to get the next single in the can. Both for us, but we were really being driven by Morris and uh, Roulette. And, uh, you know, Morris was a real slave driver in that way. And we need the next single. And uh, that was always a reality. And you always had to, uh, <laughs> you know, and by the way, it was, hey, kid, we need the next single. So, so how does the album come, so the first uh, album? Well, the first album, Hanky Panky, I'm skipping around a little bit, but the, the, the first album, Hanky Panky, we did in two weeks. And... Um, we actually uh, had to uh, uh, get into the studio immediately when uh, Hanky Panky took off. And we had a, uh, this, our second gold record came from that album. Uh, it was called Say I Am. It was a cover from basically the same record bin that they got Hanky Panky. This, by the way, was our first, no, the, the one before, was our first day in New York when we took the, uh, when we took the picture for the Hanky Panky album, these were the outfits we were in with our gold boots and, uh, and our sweaters and our dickies, remember that? And we went up to Central Park and took the, uh, uh, the album cover that I guess some of you may remember it was the uh, In the Tree where we all were sitting like birds. And um, uh, that was our very first day in New York. We had, didn't even have time to grow our hair long, so. Uh, that's how fast it all happened. And then Bell Sound Studio. By the way, Bell Sound was a very popular studio back then, became the hit factory later. But that's where we made our first, it's now the Gibson Guitar Factory. Um, but that's where we made our first album. Um, with, with two hit singles. With, yeah, and our second hit single came from that album. And so, you know, the, by the way, the idea was back then too, uh, the model, was you have a hit single and you create a market for the album. The idea was that you would, I mean, the perfect way to do that was you would have the first hit single and then you would release the album with the second single when you were sure you were going to get airplay. And uh, sometimes they'd wait till the third. But the point was you developed a market for the album. You knew you had album sales. Uh, somewhere in the late 70s, they did an album and hoped they had hit singles. You could have $2 million, $3 million invested in an album and never, never have a hit. And you never knew if the, uh, there was, the album was going to sell. So a lot of money was wasted on meaningless albums by, before you ever had a market for this stuff. So somehow it got turned around. Now, when I said tonight, the reason we're here is to talk about this, because you've just pointed out that's how the business now has reverted. So they'll put out a single. I mean, J Lo was just dropped from Sony because she put two singles out and neither one of them connected. So they don't want to. They don't want to put the album out. So they well, they've gone back. Economics have right. forced them to go backwards. The iPod has also recreated the singles market. You know, that's one of the single song downloads are what you do, and so. Um, 
that's a healthy sign, actually. The question is, at the end of all this, is there going to be a market for music? Uh, the widget business is over. We're not going to have widgets uh, as a delivery system. We're not going to have CDs. Um, we're not going to have vinyl, of course. And so the disc business is finished. Music business is still alive. And the question is, are we going to have a viable music business with so many other things to do, video games and everything else? That's a real question. Um, the album cover, we spoke of it for It's Only Love. There's, yeah. a, little, there's a little story there, right? Sure. It's Only Love was our next album. And um, our photographer was Linda Eastman, Linda McCartney. Uh, uh, she lived in my building. And she was our photographer for about a year. And until she met Paul, and then last we saw her. <laughs> she was good, though. And she took the album cover for the second album, It's Only Love. Uh, by the way, in, in the meantime, I realized I was going to have to do this by myself, so we put a production team together. And, um, uh, you know, I couldn't rely on old record bins for my singles anymore. We had to write them and we had to produce them. And so uh, Bo Gentry and Richie Cordell uh, came over from Kama Sutra to Roulette and uh, became my first. There's Richie with me. We're going to the studio here for doing something. There's Bo. Be an interesting character for. And uh, so anyway, uh, long story short, we put a production team together. Jimmy Wisner, uh, that's another shot of Richie, in the studio at Allegro. Uh, we changed studios. We went from Bell Sound to Allegro Sound and began. There's Jimmy, uh, there's Jimmy by the way. More, this is like in the 90s. But Jimmy was our George Martin. And he was an incredible arranger. And uh, uh, we started on I Think We're Alone Now is where Jimmy and I first hooked up. And that was the first record, by the way, we made at Allegro. Um, we'd had three, uh, three gold records before that. But I think We're Alone Now was first presented to me as a, um, as a, a slow song, a ballad. And we um, went into the studio, did a demo of it. This is in late 66. And that's where we came up with the doom, 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 doom that became sort of our signature sound for quite a while. I want to get into the songwriting of some of the big hits, but I wanted to go back to fame and, and, and what it does to you um, because much like celebrities today, musicians, rock stars, hip-hop artists, they get the chance to move around in circles and hoi polloi. Yeah. You had your political connection there. Well, the true enough. The, the, for me, fame was something that we could... Uh, it was nice, but I never had time to really... <laughs> really cherish it. I was, uh, um, uh, you know, we were always on this mad dash for the next single. And I must say, I was, uh, uh, I was, I was happy, but that, w w with, that was uh, with quotes around it, because I felt this incredible pressure to always uh, come up with the next record, the next album, um, there was just unbelievable pressure to uh, <clears throat> keep out doing yourself because you always have this feeling at, at any moment if you slip they can take it all away from you. So there is this obsession and this uh, um, I guess panic uh, believing you may not come up with the next record. So that always kept me on edge and uh, took a lot of the fun away of, of just enjoying the moment. I never enjoyed the moment. And the Shondells, uh, basically at this point, were not, we were not producing ourselves, we, we were, but we were always looking for the next record. So who's this guy? Uh, oh yeah. Um, we, um, well in 1968, um, uh, we had done a couple of rallies in New York uh, with Robert Kennedy. And, um, you know. Whose idea was that? Well, we, were, we, we actually had volunteered to do this. There were a lot of entertainers. So, you, so you personally were a believer in Kennedy? Yes. And so That's back when we believed that a leader, you know, a politician could actually do something. Change your life. Change the country. Um, and 
maybe it was possible to do back then. I'm not sure. Uh, but we all thought so. And uh, so we did a couple of rallies and um, got put on a list and, um, uh, for the Democratic National Committee. And um, we, the night of the Kennedy shooting, we played, of all places, Dallas, Texas. And um, we played an event called the World Teen Fair in Dallas, Texas. Um, 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 and I was standing right at Daly Plaza where John Kennedy had been killed five years earlier. And um, really just was, this was, uh, I was just amazed at how tiny an area it was. I had conversations with uh, one of Jim Garrison's secretaries I had a coast-to-coast -coast trip who told me he was shot from five different directions and I I had to see this for myself it was an amazing uh, thing to see and I just you know it made your hair stand on end it was it was a terrible moment that changed my life and made me sad for the rest of my life anyway the point was that I went back home that night and I turn on the TV just in time to uh, hear Frank McGee at uh, NBC saying there's been a shooting at Kennedy headquarters and Robert Kennedy had been shot. He didn't die till the next day. And I went into this funk that I can't describe. To me that was the day the 60s ended for me. I, I, oh, I just uh, went into this really bad funk. I stayed high for about three weeks. And uh, all of a sudden, I, we get this call <coughs> from Roulette, my secretary at Roulette, who just got off the phone with uh, a woman by the name of Ursula Culver, who was uh, Hubert Humphrey's uh, private secretary and assistant. And uh, of course, he was running for president that year, and there was no doubt about it, he was going to get nominated. And uh, uh, we were asked if we would come out on the road and play as like a warm-up act for his speeches. And I said, are you serious? And at that point, um, we really believed we were doing the right thing. And we went out. So we were to meet him the week after the convention where he was going to be nominated in Wheeling, West Virginia. And um, we were up at my apartment at uh, 52nd and 8th in Manhattan. Um, uh, the Sean, two of the members of the Shondells and I. And we're watching the 68 convention explode and all the kids are getting beat up. And we're going, my God, what have we got ourselves into? Is every rally going to be like this? What the hell is going on? And um, so we were really very concerned about meeting him the next week. We went out and did, and he couldn't have been nicer, and really, uh, uh, we hit it right off. And uh, we ended up doing the entire campaign with him. He asked me to be president's <laughs> advisor on youth affairs I said, oh, uh, at 21, and I, I think I said something like, um, believe me, Mr. Humphrey, the youth are having affairs, and I'm just the guy to look into it for you. And, uh, um, so anyway, uh, we hit it off, and, and uh, we were there all the way up until... Uh, oh, you have to tell him the story about the... He had to write the speech and stay up. Come on. I uh, had a couple of black beauties in my uh, pocket, and I gave him one. <laughs> he took it and said, By golly, those things really work! <laughs> And uh, that's I not, just... That's not true. It's a true story. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, I was going to skip over that one. Thanks, Martin. Thank yeah. you. Um, keeping, keeping it real. Yes, it was... I, I, I should have been hung. I mean, really, it, what a terrible thing. Anyway, um, I really have been ashamed of myself all that. I really have. I, I, so anyway, uh, he ended up doing the liner notes to the Crimson and Clover album. And... Uh, true story. He 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 um, did commercials for us. 
after the election was over, and we were all really disappointed, and he said, you gotta keep your eye on Dick Nixon. You gotta keep your eye on him. And um, uh, so that's how it ended. And uh, we were friends right up until he died in 78. So uh, he wrote the liner notes for us, and we, he'd write me whenever he'd do something. He went to Japan as our ambassador. And, and uh, so anyway, it was a great relationship. An another pivotal moment in the 60s was in 1969, the Woodstock Festival. Yeah. And interestingly enough, you weren't there. <laughs> or at least not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Well, what happened was um, uh, we were in Hawaii. And um, this actually happened. We, had, we were doing two dates, one in Hilo and one in Honolulu. And we had two weeks off. And uh, this, the uh, first week we had off was the week of Woodstock. And uh, I, I didn't know what Woodstock was. And uh, um, Joanne calls me from Roulette and uh, told me that, uh, uh, listen, Artie Kornfeld uh, asked if he was one of the, he was a producer. And he produced the Cow Sills and a bunch of other acts. And he was uh, a friend. and. Uh, he, uh, it, here's how it was put to me anyway. I'm sitting in paradise uh, and I get this call. Uh, Artie Kornfeld uh, uh, wants to know if you'd come and play a pig farm in upstate New York. Uh, say there's going to be a lot of people there. And uh, I said, what did you say? P play a pig farm? He says, well, it, it, it sounds awful, but it's going to be an important gig. It said there's a lot of people going to be there, a lot of important acts. I said, look, uh, if we're not there, you start without us. And they did. And by Friday, we knew we really screwed up bad. And, but I, in the end, I probably got almost as much mileage by telling the story as I would have by actually <laughs> doing it. <laughs> so. um, I'd, I'd like to open it up if any of you guys have any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll go to the questions that were submitted. Can I just, can I just uh, end it by, can. By, by saying You're not ending. Well, well, I mean, I just wanted to tell you that, that um, uh, Morris and I had an incredible blowout. And it was unbelievably, well, in, in 1971, there was a terrible gang war in New York City that where the Gambinos were taking over New York City. And Morris was on the wrong side. He was with the Genovese family. And uh, they were dropping like flies. There was something like 400 mob guys killed over a, a very short period of time in 1971. And nobody knew that this, by the way, was Tommy Eboli. This was Morris's partner at Roulette. And he was the head of the Genovese family. He was acting boss uh, when Vito was in prison. Um, uh, and when Vito died uh, in, uh, in 1969 on Valentine's Day, Tommy was made uh, head of, official head of the family. And he was assassinated in 72. But uh, you know that's how tied in Roulette was. These guys were there every day. And uh, if you want to go to one of the other, this, this is Vinny the Chin Gigante. Uh, this was when he was doing his act in the bathrobe, remember? He was, he was. Uh, to the younger one. <clears throat> this is a younger version. Uh, this was in 1957 after he had uh, attempted to kill Frank Costello, um, who was the head of the Genovese family at that time. What happened was uh, Tommy Eboli, who was Morris's partner, uh, was also a fight promoter. And uh, uh, he was pretty successful at it, uh, in addition to the other things he did. And one of his fighters was Vin Vincent Giganti. And um, you can go back to the. And uh, uh, so he uh, was Vito Genovese's uh, right hand man. And he was given orders from Vito Genovese to take out Frank Costello. I'm just telling you what they told me. Uh, and Frank Costello, who 
was the acting was the boss of the family at that time. So they go to Frank Costello's uh, uh, apartment building or hotel where he was living in uh, on the east on the Upper West Side, and Tommy Ryan drives the car, and uh, Vinnie the Chin uh, is the shooter. And they go in, and he points the gun right at Costello, pulls the trigger, and he lives right at his head. And the bullet went around his skull instead of through it, and he lived. And he ended up retiring and was the only head of, uh, the, of, of a mob family to ever retire with his money. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Giganti became a major up-and-comer then, and um, uh, became a capo in the family and uh, uh, was a regular at roulette. And uh, you want to go to uh, Fat Tony, too? Might as well get them all in. Okay. And this is uh, Tony Salerno. They called him Fat Tony. And the, uh, uh, the reason there's, uh, well, you may recall The Sopranos where Fat Tony Soprano was taken from this character. Uh, Salerno was, a, uh, was also a roulette regular and um, I was up there a lot. And there's another picture of him. <laughs> This is my dad. And, and um, um, by the way, Morris Levy, whom they used to call Moish, was Hesh Rabkin in The Sopranos, the old, um, uh, uh, the old record promoter uh, with the horse farm. This is up at his farm. And so Hesh was Moish, and Fat Tony was Fat Tony. And so they obviously had an in-house wise guy directing traffic, uh, you know, technical advisor on The Sopranos. So anyway, there was this terrible war in 71. And uh, this is such a cute picture. Yes. You'll catch your death. <laughs> uh, this is Fat Tony Salerno and Morris's son, Adam. Uh, he's helping him gently on with his coat in the winter, tying his parka. And um, so anyway, that's a dog. That's not a person. <laughs> and this is up at Morris's farm. So anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is this uh, uh, gang war breaks out. Morris takes off and leaves all of us at roulette. He takes off with Nate McCall for Spain because they had, you know, he felt that he was on the list. And my lawyer... Uh, Harold Orenstein calls me in to the office and says, we think it would be a real good idea if you uh, left town for a few weeks. So I'm on the lam. I said, so he's, the, and the reason he said that was is if they can't get Morris, they're liable to go after <coughs> whoever's making Morris money, and that's you. So I go to Nashville and make uh, a Nashville album. I called my head, my bed, and red guitar with uh, DJ Fontana, Scotty Moore, and Elvis's old crew, and um, uh, Pete, Drake. Pete Drake and uh, Buddy Harmon, and a whole lot of uh, great Nashville pick. Greatest album I ever did, probably. Got the best review in Rolling Stone. Sold four records. And um, uh, I come back. Uh, as a matter of fact, the picture on the book was when I snuck back into town in 1971. That picture on the book was taken at the Persian Room at the Plaza Hotel. That's not the one. That was taken with the same, the same night. Uh, you can handle the co book cover, can't you? There it is, there it is. And uh, that, that shirt, too, uh, somebody asked me what happened with that shirt. I think I smoked it. That was, uh, uh, that was, <laughs> Anyway, um, the point is I snuck back into town to have this little party where they gave me a bunch of gold records, and then I went back down to Nashville. And um, anyway, during that time, my accountant, Aaron Schechter, comes up with a brilliant idea to get a count from Morris because we knew we'd been ripped off so badly. So uh, instead of going at to the, after the vinyl, he goes after the labels. 
and, and which I thought was brilliant, never been done before, and got an honest count as to how many labels were pressed up and so how many records were sold. And uh, with those calculations, it shipped. was Shipped. Huh? How many were shipped? Shipped. Correct. Correct. So he had to kind of do a little formula there. So, um, but it. Because he would tell them how many records they had to take, the distributors. Correct. Correct. So they figured through that formula that it was somewhere between 30 and 40 million dollars that he owed us. That's pu the publishing, the, the writing, and the royalties uh, that we'd never received. You know, we'd never got. He, he had your publishing? He had my publishing, yes, until 79, and it reverted back. Um, that's another thing. Don't give up your publishing. Ever, ever, ever give up your publishing. That's the ownership of the song. So uh, long story short, uh, uh, he confronts Morris with this when he gets back and Morris says, you ever use that, they're going to fish you out of a river. And he meant it. And so that was the end of our, I so I knew I had to get off the label and so Mor that's when Morris and I had the blowout. And uh, it was pretty scary, I, I'll be honest with you. I, we didn't know how that was going to end. I finally got off the label in 74, 75, went out to, uh, fantasy records out on the West Coast. Got as far away from New York as I could. One of the students, Lonnie, asked the question, if it's appropriate, during your time working with Morris and the mob, did you ever find your life in any sort of immediate danger? Yeah. And so you'd have to say Several that. times. There's other times, too. And the other question was, uh, were you concerned when writing this book, and are you concerned now about any living connections Morris Levy had with the mob for releasing your story to the public? Well, the answer is, <coughs> um, we were very uncomfortable. I, you know, here I am speaking for you. I'm sorry, you know, Mar right. Martin's brilliant. He's a, he's a great writer, and uh, I'm hogging the show here. But, but when we you started. You answer that question. <laughs> well, we started a while ago. We started about 11 years ago almost to do this. I didn't know what I was getting into. I had just written a book on the bitter end, and I met Tommy through that, and we decided to do the story. And initially, we were going to do really just, you know, Tommy's career. I thought it was. Uh, you know, fast, good, wonderful story. Uh, the more we investigated and the more he told me about Morris, because I didn't know much about him, if anything, it just became apparent that this was the story. You know, the, uh, uh, the hits, the fame, the pills, the, uh, that kind of stuff, in a sense it had been done, but nobody had a story like this with, with uh, roulette records and what he had to go through. Uh, the only problem was that a lot of these guys were still around. And uh, we found things to do. Uh, we worked on a TV show. Uh, to one thing about Tommy, he kept me in spaghetti. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't complain. You know, he was always giving me work. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful all that time, traveling around, you know, working with the band. But w we keep going back to it. And finally, about, uh, what was it, three years ago or so? Uh, Vinny the Chin finally died in prison, and he was the last of the roulette regulars. I think Mr. Vestola is still alive, but he's we, on a walker. Yeah, he's we can run faster and I can than him. Run him. That's <laughs> but uh, uh, I think right. other well, than what, that, but what, but what about their offspring? I mean, for example, we don't Morris's know, son Adam is still around. Yeah, and 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 and, and, so and a player. So. Zach's a good friend of ours, and so is Adam. Yeah, we've made uh, other, you know. So don't they? No, they're actually proud of it. I mean, I mean, you know, Adam is proud of his dad in that respect. They're not chips off the old block. Yeah. Uh, there's a very interesting, uh, one of the other, it was. That's Adam when he was a kid. Tom, Tommy Ebeley's um, uh, family is very supportive of all this. Um, uh, strangely. Tommy Ebeley's niece met us. Thanked us for uh, yeah, being, being so kind to her uncle. Fair to her uncle. Uh, you know, he was what he was, and they know it. So, anyway, so. But when she showed me her husband's business card and was in waste management, yeah, her husband I did get a in little waste nervous. Management. <laughs> <laughs> so Quite we sure how to take So that. who did you waste, and how'd you manage to stay out of jail? <laughs> <laughs> but after Vinny the Chin died, we all we we re returned to the book in earnest and other people were now very encouraging and said let's just do it and so it took us 11 years the first half took us uh, probably you know 10 eight, yeah 10 years to write and the, the second part took about 10 six weeks months, yeah. <laughs> so. 
By the way, the, this, I call this the hanky-panky story on steroids because what happened was, it, it's funny because the, what happened after uh, uh, we, we immediately got uh, a book deal with half the book. We hadn't even finished. Was through Simon and Sh we got signed to Simon & Schuster ha only having half a book. Scribner. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, the next thing that happened is we, we start getting calls from movie people. This is going to be a movie in about 18 months. And um, we, we actually, the first call we got was from Martin Scorsese's office. But, uh, uh, I, you know, I, he may or may not, we may or may not end up uh, uh, having him as the director. But the point is that this is the kind of interest that immediately uh, took hold uh, in L.A. Uh, with the movie people. And on Broadway. And it's going to be a Broadway play after that. And one of the producers of this is the... John Osher, who produced Jersey Boys. So we're, we're just really uh, blown away by all this. The, the thing has exploded. And the book is behaving more like a hit record than a book. It's not really behaving like a book. And uh, I'm just so absolutely blown away by the reception this has gotten. And uh, of course, guys like you, I uh, thank you so much for letting this. Uh, thank you for taking the time here. Sure. I want to get some more of these questions. Absolutely. Suyi wanted to know. Uh, when exactly did you first realize the music business isn't always faithful and has its corrupt sides? And was it when you were told you had to record, first record Pretty Little Red Bird ah. <laughs> that you can record anything you wanted? Or was it when you first overheard about the beatings when you met Morris? Well, both. Um, you know, uh, truthfully, uh, uh, the, 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 the Niles stuff, what they're talking about is that uh, w when we signed to do Hanky Panky, we uh, actually had to do the producer's song first and put it out with our name on it, um, which we hated. It was called Pretty Little Red Bird. Is that, is that horrible enough? It, Pretty Little Red Bird. And um, so we had to put out. But there was a big hit then by Lawrence Welk, Yellow Bird. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, right. before we could do Hanky Panky, we had to do this anyway. That was kind of funny. But, uh, it wasn't until really, we suspected things at Roulette were, were not all right. But I mean, we, we had this pie in the face um, uh, when we went for our money. That's really when the whole thing came together and we realized that these are bad people. Because it wasn't just Morris you were dealing with, it was all the people that were backing up Morris. And uh, um, it was, in you know, funny, in many ways, it was a family with an abusive father. That's how Roulette always felt to me. There was this um, uh, wonderful cast of people at Roulette. Um, uh, you know, the, the various people in the various offices, the head of marketing and sales, and the, uh, Red Schwartz, who was, uh, you know, uh, taught me the radio business. This was really uh, a family uh, with this uh, abusive, head of the family, and uh, that's how it felt. Yeah, but you were the golden child. You were, you were I, singularly, I, after Frankie Lyman died, you were roulette records for on the pop side. Well, the, actually, they had Joey D, and they had, uh, you know, a lot of artists. But, those, but, those but nobody when we were there. That's true. There's nobody when we were there. And, and they just never got any more acts. They didn't need any other. We were, we were, uh, we were put, every record we put out during that time was, was scorned for them. You know, and long before... Uh, Tommy, the, 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 I, I guess not so much the music business as the nightclub business, the clubs, the venue business, yeah. was always infiltrated by them. I've gone back to Sinatra. That's where the booze was. That's where the cigarettes were. That's where the prostitutes Morrison's were. Bird, Birdland. Birdland, Mars on the Round Table. Those were all interests that the mob was into. He managed Alan Freed. He was Alan Freed's manager. They, he came this close to trademarking the term rock and roll. And can you imagine what that would have? This is Morris right here. This is Morris's secretary, Karen, who we're very close with now. She's a, uh, all the, the surviving roulette people, there's only two or three of us now. We all hang out together. Uh, uh, that's Karen back there now. And this is uh, Norman, Kurtz. Norman Kurtz, the in-house lawyer. You want to flip back lawyer. again? 
That's Morris's son, picture, by the way. That's, that's Zach. Uh, no, that's Zach. Uh, Norman is Norman standing is, uh, next, to next to Karen right there. This is Bob Austin, the head of uh, Record World. Record World. Uh, that's Nate McCalla, who uh, was Morris's bodyguard and enforcer. He was assassinated uh, in the 80s. 80s down in Florida. He was tied to a chair, and they found him about three weeks later with a lot of flies and a hole in his face. It was pretty awful. Uh, uh, this is Larry Utah right there, and his, uh, uh, they call his secretary, but they, they, she was, uh, the two of them ran Amy Malibel Records, remember? Uh, long before Private Star. This was at the round table. This is going to be a scene in the movie, by the way. Uh, the night at, the, at the, the round table club that Morris owned, he'd throw these big Christmas parties that would last for days, and you'd have city councilmen in New York sitting with the mob guys and... It was unbelievable. I mean, you know, people from the mayor's office. Cardinal sitting, Spellman might Cardinal walk by, Spellman. you know. <laughs> he didn't go to the round table, but he had his arm around Morris a lot. Uh, Charisse asked this question. <clears throat> Does payola play a vital part in the music industry now? And are there still music executives like Levy in the music industry? Are those guys like Levy, do they play off the artist's lack of education of the business? and take the expression of acting as a bank to, to the limit in the 60s and 70s and now? And does the mod still play a part in history? A lot well, of, a lot of questions. Uh, that's a big one. Um, the, uh, the truth is that the, the record business is so tiny now, what I call the record business, we really the, the CD business is so tiny. Um, relatively speaking, there's uh, only about a tenth, maybe, Maybe more than that of the uh, of the record buying public. There's no uh, record buying. Uh, the people who um, are financing the record business are individuals now. The reason that that sort of eliminates the mob factor is because there's no more um, big time promotion men. Uh, radio stations tend to uh, play what they want. Um, one of the great myths, and I hate to disillusion anybody, but it is almost non-existent because uh, uh, making it today. This myth that if you try real hard and play real good, you can go make a record. And no, you can't. It's not going to be that way. Um, what is interesting and what uh, anyway, the, the, the mob doesn't play anywhere near the kind of role it used to. First of all, the mobsters are different. Uh, uh, they're not the street guys. Well, with a few exceptions. I mean, I'm talking about the Italian mob. It's not... Uh, it can still be pretty dangerous. I mean, you remember in the hip-hop world, all the you know, Biggie yeah. Smalls and Tupac, they were shot to death. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's still some... <laughs> You know, crazy Nasty guys characters out there. Man. Out there. But uh, uh, the record business has really changed in that regard, and I, I guess that's good. It's kind of like, you know, people asking the question, was Vegas better when the mob ran it? I, I don't know. In some ways, I suppose it was. But, um, uh, you know, things will never be the same again. This record business was typically American, and it's gone. It was as American as being a cowboy. Being a rock star was very much like being a cowboy or an astronaut. Um, it was very American. It was a, an American invention. Um, the whole infrastructure uh, is gone now, with the exception of guys like you. And, and you know, uh, uh, satellite radio has done actually pretty well in the last. It's actually probably will continue. Uh, terrestrial radio is just done. I think it'll come back at some point, but for right now it's just done. And of course with it goes uh, a great deal of the music business. You know what I would suggest to somebody young starting out today? Write your own songs and get a deal with a publisher. EMI Music, for example, the publisher that has my uh, roulette stuff. We publish our own stuff now, but Publishers are doing what the labels used to. 
That is, they are uh, showcasing the groups. They are putting the groups in places like uh, BMI gatherings and ASCAP gatherings and college uh, gatherings and conventions. And the, the publishers um, have a vested interest in uh, your songs. You, 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 you're a songwriter, write 20 songs, take them to a publisher, uh, do a deal, create a deal for yourself. Uh, and also, I would say, um, uh, the publishers, because they, they're the last people with money in the music business. And um, so therefore, m my suggestion is write your songs. If you don't write your songs, there's no hope. Write your own songs, demo them as best you can, do a deal with a publisher, uh, write what's on the radio, and uh, uh, that is the best thing I can offer right now. That really is the truth. Thank you. Andrew asks, what connections in the industry that you've made are your strongest ones and the ones you consider most desirable? Um, I think the strongest relationship, well, there are two of them. One of them is, is with the good Lord because I'm, I'm in a business that, uh, you know, maybe gives you th two to three years and we've been doing it for 40 plus. Uh, uh, and I mean that with all my heart. Uh, secondly, the fans. Uh, the fans have just been so great to us. I mean, I look out at our concert crowd now, I see three generations of people um, that don't necessarily know each other but know all the music. And they have just been so good to us. They're buying the books. They're, you know, w whatever venture we get into, they support us. And they've been putting food on my table for 44 years now, so which so goes without a doubt. To which fans. goes to the next question from Shannon. What was it like having fame at such a young age, and would you have done anything differently now looking back? Well, I'd have been a better businessman, of course, but there's only, you know, in the situation I was in, there's only so much having a business head could do for you. Um, uh, if somebody's determined to rip you off, that's just the way it's going to be. Um, I, you just got to live it. I, I wish there was, I mean, you know, don't fool, you know, clean up your room, don't fool with drugs. Um, truthfully, uh, the, the basic stuff is, is the way to go. And I would say also, you know, you have to, you have to have a good handle on your soul. Because uh, when you're on the road, for example, and you're, out, you're scattered, you're out here on the road and you're, um, uh, you're meeting people and strangers and everything is, that hardens you uh, like you wouldn't believe. It, it also wrecks your health. Uh, I don't know how some of these guys, I never could tour like that. I never could do what these, some of these guys, Rod Stewart would go out and just blow it out for a year. The stones would, I, I, I don't know how they, you know, kept from killing themselves. Uh, they'd find me under a trestle somewhere with the, I don't know, begging for water or something. I, I, there's no way I could <coughs> do money, money, uh, you know, six nights a week. I mean, it wouldn't happen. The, 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 it dovetails very nicely. The next question from Apollonar says, do you think it's possible for rock stars to stay away from the temptations and lifestyles such as drugs, cheating, and alcohol? It's awfully easy to take chemicals, I must say, because... Uh, of uh, you know amazing boredom, uh, fear. Um, going on stage is a is a ferocious thing when you're playing rock and roll, and and when you're doing it for a living, it's one of the hardest things there is to do. Um, being away from your family, your loved ones, uh, it's kind of like going to prison when you're out on the road, and it's very easy to start taking chemicals, especially to drink. It's incredibly easy. I went to the Betty Ford Center in 86 and got off. I was a garbage head. I'm, I'm an alcoholic. And um, I got off everything. And uh, I, I can't tell you what a difference that's made. And by the way, I was a very angry guy 
I had a lot of anger inside me about the way I was treated at roulette and the money I was ripped off of, I, r r was, w that was ripped off of me. And um, I was very angry and I, I, I became very dark, I mean really dark. And uh, I, although I was a Christian and still am, I became uh, extremely, uh, I would snap. Uh, you know, a promoter wouldn't pay or there was some discrepancy with a player or a musician. I would snap. And um, when I went to the Betty Ford Center and got off alcohol, Valium, and all the other stuff, all the garbage, all the rest of the garbage in 86, um, a lot of those demons left. What really did it for me <coughs> was my first gig uh, after the Betty Ford Center. I hadn't gone on stage sober since I was probably 17 years old, 16 years old. And I uh, told them, I said, you know, how am I gonna do this straight? And their response to me was, you know, one day at a time, all the cliches. And I finally said, okay, okay, what do you think I should do? And they said, well, we recommend that you go into small venues and just practice being you again and seeing what it's like. So the first date I take is Madison Square Garden. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm scared, I'm scared, well, excuse my French, but I just am scared to death. And uh, um, I get up on stage, I get weak knees, and the place is filled, and I go up and I, uh, I'm going, M making a li live in the old, and uh, I'm forgetting words to songs, and I'm just, uh, by the third song, I'm having a ball. And I, and the reason is, everything is now, right now. The reaction, the feeling, the love I'm getting from the people is right now. I had been acting, and I had, I didn't realize it. So okay, now it's time to turn this way and wave like that. Now it's time to smile over here. And I had gone through that so many times that I was not feeling what I was doing. To just go out there and be one-on-one -on -one with those people feeding you right back was like being in love again. It was the most amazing thing I ever felt. It was intoxicating. By the third song, I'm having a ball. I couldn't wait to do the next gig. I hadn't felt that since I was 15 years old. And all those demons left me. That was the final uh, cleansing. Um, all the anger, I just wasn't angry anymore. And um, uh, you know, my relationship with God was a thousand percent better, I just, you know, it's hard being it's hard being a drunk and and being a Christian. It's real tough. <laughs> I tried, believe me. Um, anyway, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Another angle here. Um, this is from Krista Cook. At, at this point in my music career, she says, "I'd take any opportunity I could get, being that I currently own 100% of nothing." <laughs> Do you feel that the members of the Coachman regret not accompanying you to Pittsburgh to promote Hanky Panky, even if they weren't in the realm to replace the original Shondells? Isn't 15 minutes of fame better than an entire life of no name? Well, uh, what that question is about is a group that, uh, that I had uh, called the Coachman was the name of the group that I had on the road when Hanky Panky um, hit. You know, we, got, we were out on the road and that was the name of our group. It wasn't the Shondells, it was the Coachman. And I ended up, uh, when Hanky Panky, when I was told this incredible story that the record was sitting at number one, they didn't really believe it. And they were older. They were all older than me by, you know, eight, 10, 12 years. And I, um, you know, they didn't believe it and they didn't go with me to Pittsburgh. I went by myself. I'm sure they, they would have liked to have gone in the end. Um, but, you know, we just, that was, I always felt that was God's way of just moving me on. I had to, I had to leave. Um, I, I couldn't have done it with them, I don't think. I don't think, it, I needed a young band of guitar playing 
you know, poop stompers, you know. And, you know, it had to be gut bucket rock and roll. Steve Carter asks, how is the process better or worse when co-writing a song with other people versus writing it by yourself? Um, well, I used to have a habit. To me, writing was a very social affair. I, I, I want. I, I, I seem to. I really like bouncing ideas off of people, or having them come to me with some totally off the wall thing, and then I toy with it. But the truth is that more recently, in the last five, ten years, I have uh, really enjoyed writing by myself. I find myself doing things now with songwriting I never did before that I can't really do with anybody else. One of them is, um, I've never told this, but one of the things I do now is, uh, uh, I, you know, a few years back I'm playing the one, four, five chords and the relative minors and all the chords that used, used to turn me on, and they're just sounding tired to me. I'm just somehow tired of these same chords over and over again, you know, backwards and forwards, and I just, and I started toying with a few jazz chords and doing things I'd never done again until I finally, I mean, everybody loves the structure of pop. You know, they like the verse, the hook, the, uh, the bridge, the, going, the instrumental, the hook, the fade. Everybody loves three minute records basically. Uh, some can be a little longer, some a little less, but basically we've all decided that this is the formula we like. Well, uh, so I like to take the pop structure and then toy with it a little bit. Now I find myself really doing things like with a guitar. I don't mean to get too inside, but instead of, um, uh, for example, I'll play a uh, an E chord. Right? I play an open guitar. By the way, I don't. I don't play an E chord like this. I play open guitar, where the we're just open. It's a. It's an E chord. Uh, when I write, and when I go, for example, then to the four chord, the A chord, which is the next chord, uh, rather than have the root chord root note be E to A, I'll have the I'll have the 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 bottom string be a third up, you know, like it'll be an E chord with a G sharp bass, and suddenly that just evokes something in me melody-wise, and I, and I go with a different melody. I just somehow use inversions of the chords, or I'll stick a ninth in there, just for the hell of it, and just, I'm starting to play jazz chords uh, in a pop structure, and I can't tell you, I know that's a little out there, but I mean, uh, I can't tell you what that means to me. It, it suddenly, uh, rock and roll starts sounding uh, a little more sophisticated. It starts sounding better to me. Is there something, I, I don't know, it just, sounded, it just sounded so juvenile to me of playing these same one C, F, G chords for 50 years. I mean, there's only, only so many melodies you can get out of C, F, G. And then you gotta change, and I, that change I'm, I, I, I'm sincerely into right now, and I love doing it. Now that's a far cry from how you wrote thank you, Mirage. Thank you. No, Mirage. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, Mirage uh, was the follow up to I Think We're Alone Now, and it literally was I Think We're Alone Now backwards. We um, um, were listening to the final mix of I Think We're Alone Now, and this actually happened. Uh, you know, back then we had to do it with a reel to reel tape recorder. I'm listening to a seven and a half of, and I don't know what we were smoking, but whatever it was, we got the, the tape on upside down. And when we did that, it would play backwards. So we're sitting there listening to I Think We're Alone Now backwards. He says, you know, that's not bad. That's not a bad little chord progression. And uh, the guitars sounded like cellos and everything. So uh, Bo and Richie went off in the corner and wrote it. And it became the next single. It was called Mirage. It was, I think we're alone now, backwards. That's a true story. Sounds like a press agent made that up, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Oh, it's oh right, 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 right. That's a true story. There's a question from uh, David Levy. How did the days of top bands 
quantifying success with the louder the screams, the bigger you are compared with today's success measures where merchandising and marketing are key. Yeah, you know, groups go in and actually, uh, you, you know, sell more in merchandise than they make on the show. It's incredible. They show up with trucks to sell t-shirts and stuff. Um, I don't know. I still think, look, there's, there's still this uh, in-your-face rock and roll where people react and respond. I think audiences, the one thing that really hasn't changed very much is live shows. You still have people out there who want to hear music, who, who uh, you know, are willing to pay money to see their favorite act, and, and they know what's good. People basically know what's good when you're playing it for them. They know what's bad real quick. And, and we do have T-shirts on sale. Yeah, by the way, the DVD. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and I, anyway, I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> There's the it's a question um, from uh, Michael. <clears throat> in your early years living in Monroe and Niles, being at the record store made for a significant experience for you. I'm curious how you would think it might have changed your musical career if you'd grown up in an, in an era where no or far less emphasis on the music store and vinyl. In other words, with the digital age being dominant in 2010, how do you think this changed music and musical experiences for the youth 50 years well, later? Well, that's, that's a great point. And I think, uh, you know, the record shop, uh, I got an education at the record shop. I learned who, what the labels were. I learned who the songwriters were. I studied 45s like other kids did baseball cards. And uh, I learned the publishers. I learned... Uh, who the players were, and um, oh yeah, and uh, can you I, just go to the Snap record just for a second? The, the there's a very good point here because the the uh, the record uh, company the, the 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 record store was part of the infrastructure. When when they found the Snap record up in Pittsburgh, they had no idea who he was or where he was, but they saw Niles, Michigan. Yeah, on the. Uh, and where did they call? On the label, they called the record shop, the local record shop. Where I shop, used to work. Because that was the hub of, of any town where the, where the music was, and they would know something. And it was just ironic that uh, in a million to one shot that he had, Tommy actually worked there. So th that was a huge part of it, it uh, even more than just learning the business or the, the, the labels. A and mom stuff. and pop record shop, mom and they pop used to record call shop. Yeah. If I hadn't had that job in that record store, um, there would have been this huge missing piece of the puzzle. Um, not only did I get to promote the band out of there, but I made use of all those, all those things, those labels, those songwriters, all that stuff. I'm still using stuff today that I learned in that record store. And um, uh, that's all missing from today's music experience because you don't have record store. And uh, uh, now, there are things you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I've, I think downloading is great, and I think it's a... Uh, I've often wondered, for example, I've got to tell you, I've, and I, you tell me this, I've often wondered why satellite radio doesn't offer downloading. Uh, you know, uh, they've got your billing information. It would be an endless source of revenue. Uh, for 99 cents or whatever you wanted to charge, you push a button on your boom box or on your car radio to Sirius XM. I used to, Pat Clark, you knew Pat Clark, right? Pat Clark was at XM, ran the 60s channel at XM. And I used to have marathon talks with him about why aren't you downloading? You know, why do you rely on subscriptions, which, you know, no wonder you're going broke. You know, why don't you download? The record companies would love you. The, 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 the artists would love you. Everybody would love you for doing that, and everybody would get paid at the point somebody pushed the button. You know, you could have a, a formula, a digital formula, written into the code right there that, you know, goes to this bank account and that bank account, get paid at the speed of light. So why wouldn't you do that? I, I never figured out. I never could get a straight answer. Why? Why? <laughs> um, I, th I think it's something that they've always aspired to do. I know there's some um, unfortunate business affairs people at labels who are preventing it from happening. But I think in our lifetime we'll see that. Yeah. Um, I think you see that now with um, iTunes marking on the HD um, radio sets. 
that are not widely out there yet. Right. So I just th I think it's a matter of time before um, something like that happens, but it's going to take those business affairs people to wake up. Yeah, label, he's right about that. The labels um, probably do have a problem with that. If there's a speed bump, that's where it is. The whole music business is going to move to television then, and getting new music in front of the fans is everything. Right now, there's no way to do that other than... I mean, you don't punch a name into your computer that you don't know. You know, you, I mean, you may punch a song that you'd heard before or something, but you don't, you know, you don't, you don't punch something in your computer you've never heard of. So the point is, you've, there's got to be a delivery system um, that we don't have yet, and that is probably going to be television. It's going to be when this is all interactive. You know those um, channels at the upper end of your television dial where they have big bands and they've got, well, that's, all, that's probably all going to end up being interactive where you can download stuff from those channels and you can, uh, you know, surf those things and hear new music. It, uh, Will, go ahead. It's very hard because, in, you know, now you have about 150 channels. Back in the 60s, there were three channels. That was it. You, you either watch the Ed Sullivan show or Lassie or, the, you know, a, a Jackie Gleason show. So, so there wasn't, you, you know, even if a third of the population chose each one, that was still a third of the whole country watching that one thing. Yeah. Now with so many channels, it's almost impossible. And the same with Top 40 music. Everybody was hearing the same and songs. The same songs. You could meet a guy from Seattle you know, and, and from New York and Texas and Chicago, and you'd all know the same thing. We'd all have read about it in Life magazine in the barbershop, we, you know, and, and we would have seen it on, on Dick Clark. There, w there wasn't any choice, and that was very helpful. I will tell you, we have thought, we've talked about doing a new TV variety show. The people that we're hanging with now, do, you know, in movies and television, that as a result of this project, actually, are going to uh, step up and um, my prediction is you're going to get somebody like a Harry Connick or somebody who's going to be a just a sort of neutral character that uh, uh, will present uh, s talent uh, where, where you had a comedian on with the uh, you know the the animal act you know somebody's going to do that somebody's going to have a television variety show and they're probably going to spring up all over my guess is once one of them makes it you're going to have 20 copycats and so that's going to be i mean i think that's healthy um philip asked uh, who what artists do you see as being creative and totally original today oh god that's so hard to any, anyone in it's particular? So hard. Well, there's acts like Green Day that are, uh, you know, seem to have. Uh, I mean, you look at you know Lady Gaga and all the the interesting, you know, things. That, the thing that made radio great, right? And we were a creation of. Was that uh, you sort of made up your own video, you, in your mind. You, you, the music was. The music was what you concentrated on because that's all you had. You had audio. It's almost as if too much video clutters up your brain and, and you're really distracted from hearing the music. I don't know if a lot of the acts that make it as a uh, as sort of a culty kind of personality thing, I don't know if they'd make it if just their music if you were hearing just their music. I don't know, that's a, it's a very interesting question. It's a, you know, would you, buy, would you buy their music if you didn't know what they looked like? I don't know. You know, when, when, when the 60s hit, and, and, and there, there was no sense that there was any real history, that things, ca it was all happening right now. You know, Elvis Presley was only five years old. You know, then the Beatles came on, it was, it was all going on. Now, you guys, or guys, you know, in their 20s or something like that, if, if I was you, I would want to go back and, and, and listen to, to what came before, because now there's this whole history, 50 years old. My daughter, who's 25, has a, you know, she goes out and sees new bands and everything, but she's, all of a sudden, she's discovered Led Zeppelin. <laughs> you know, she's discovered <laughs> the Beatles. That's know. true. Uh, and, and she's into it. She, did, she never heard this stuff before, so. 
I, mean, I, know, I know I told Tommy I'd not keep him too late. So um, yeah, you got to get to bed, you know, Sonny. Well, um, I want to thank him uh, for taking the time coming out here tonight, talking to you guys. I know if you, any of you have your books with you, if you'd like him to sign it, um, Carol said that you would be willing to hang out she for a She told minutes. you that? Yes, and she you did. you bought that? Okay. I bought it. I bought the book, too. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you. Let's thank Tommy and thank Martin. You.